About two years ago, me and my friend were smoking in the forest at around 2 a.m. For some context, this wasn't a U.S. style camping trip in the deep woods. This forest is on the outskirts of London Pole Hill, if anyone's interested, and we used to hang out there in our little den and blaze. We knew the area very well, and we obviously didn't have to worry about mountain lions or anything, and we always felt reasonably safe. So we're sitting there talking away when all of a sudden we hear this noise coming from what sounded like about 5-10 meters away. It was loud and sounded like a really big gas valve being opened for a few seconds and then closed with a kind of pop at the end. Or that noise a hot 8 balloon makes as it fills up. We were more confused and curious than scared as we knew there were no gas tanks or pipes or any hot air balloons anywhere near us. But it was enough to make us both jump. It was especially strange because it was just not a mysterious or creepy location. Just a smallish wood mostly used by dog walkers. Yeah, I'd go there for a walk as opposed to a hike. Anyway, we decide to check about a bit in the direction it came from, and when we couldn't find anything and we started joking about invisible aliens, and I actually started to feel afraid. Then we saw about five people with lights coming across a small clearing towards us. Oddly, they weren't really walking together and were all separated by a couple of meters. And the torches they had were like 50 centimeter long strip lights. We didn't feel threatened, more like we just weren't supposed to be there, so we left pretty hastily. We felt like they were looking for whatever made the sound. My friend likes to say an alien ship landed near us, and we saw some government officials going to meet them. I would welcome a more rational explanation. My best is that there is indeed some sort of gas outlet totally hidden in the brambles near our den, and the people were just British gas employees. Still seems strange, though. I currently live near Portland, Oregon. I was recently talking to a neighbor about a strange encounter he had while working at Crater Lake National Park back in the late 1980s. The man was clearing brush and repairing a trail. One evening, soon after he clocked out, he realized he had forgotten his work bag, so he drove back to the work site. He began walking along the trail that led to where he had been working. It was then that he felt a presence like something was watching him. He says that at the time he had no idea what it was, but knew it was definitely there. He continued walking and heard a strange singing sound coming from the forest. It was like a woman or a child was out there. He said it was haunting and strange. He said it seemed to be coming from the direction where he had been working, which made him apprehensive about continuing. As a result, he became so concerned that he decided to retrieve the bag the next day. So he turned around and headed back to his truck. He began walking back, but heard footsteps in the distance behind him. He turned around but saw no one, so he quickened his steps and continued walking. He then heard footsteps following him and keeping pace with him. When he stopped, he said it wasn't long before he felt an overwhelming sense of danger. He began to run back to his truck. Just before he reached his truck, he turned around, and that's when he saw it. He observed two bluish-colored eyes looking at him through the darkness. He said that there was evil in those eyes. As he watched, the rest of the creature gradually came to him. What he saw was humanoid in appearance and pale gray in color. He said it kept low. He was transfixed by the sight and paralyzed. It slowly crept towards him. Its head looked alien-like in appearance. It then stopped and stared at him without blinking. Then it quickly turned and disappeared into the undergrowth. After standing there shocked and paralyzed for a minute or two, he moved. He was intrigued by what he had witnessed. He then stepped forward to try to find this being and looked around for 30 minutes. He could not locate anything. There was no sign of it at all. He eventually gave up his search and walked back to his truck. He returned to where he first heard the singing sounds, and now there were tracks that looked like dog tracks, but were quite large. There were only four toes on each print, rather than the five that you would expect from a normal dog. After looking at these tracks for a few minutes trying to figure out what made them, he had this strange sensation. His mind went blank, and he couldn't remember why he was there or what had happened. He then decided to leave the area and head home. The next day, while at work, his boss radioed him and asked if he had seen anything strange in that area. 
Another worker reported seeing something unusual. He said yes and described the humanoid creature with gray skin and evil eyes. His boss was dismissive and he attempted to explain it away. He and his boss went to the area to look for the tracks. Once they arrived at the area and after looking around for a few minutes, he remembers that his mind went blank again. He blacked out again like before and when he looked up from the tracks, his boss was missing. He then glanced at his watch. Over two hours had passed. It was now mid-afternoon and he couldn't remember the previous two hours. That terrified him. He walked back to the parking lot hoping to find his truck. It was still there. He got in and immediately returned to the main station where his boss was sitting in his office. He asked him what had happened, but his boss just looked up as if nothing had occurred. His boss asked him casually how his day was progressing, as if nothing had transpired earlier. That was his last day working at Crater Lake. He realized he had encountered an otherworldly entity and wanted nothing to do with it. In the many years since that incident, he has never experienced anything out of the ordinary. But he stays away from Crater Lake and never plans to return to the park. I live in Chicago in East Garfield. In June 2017, I was at a local grocery store buying food. I walked to my car, loaded the two bags into my back seat, then got into the driver's seat. As I started the car, to my shock, a young, pale-skinned woman with long, dark hair was sitting on the passenger side. The first thing I noticed were her coal-black eyes. She looked right into my eyes and said, I need help. Please help me. She literally looked like the walking dead or zombie. I told her to get out, but she insisted that I take her to the hospital. I was scared. We weren't too far from the hospital, so I headed there. If she was crazy, I thought that I would placate her. We were about two blocks away and at a red light, when she suddenly jumped out of the car, took a few steps and vanished. No trace of her. She didn't appear like a ghost, but she was solid in form. It was as if she ran through an invisible doorway. The next day, I felt sick to my stomach and my eyes were sore and red. I believe it had something to do with this black-eyed woman. I didn't feel 100% until a week later and the terrible nightmares continued for months. This may not be related, but some of my family and friends had unexplained activity in their homes, including my brother. He lived a few blocks from me and swears there was a demon in his basement. He and his girlfriend would not venture down there and soon moved away. He had terrible dreams as well. I wish I knew what was going on. Some years back, I worked at a concrete plant myself in an old quarry, which used to be part of a large estate, so the area was mostly mature woodland. This was December in Scotland, so it was getting dark by 3 p.m. On a break, I took my Jack Russell out for a wander and deep in the woods spied a tent. Since the dog is a cunt, she ran over to inspect, and I had to follow JR's refuse to do if all they are told. Tent was old and the fly sheet was breaking up, I had to look inside but only cause there was no stench and the dog was there. Inside was a sleeping bag, steel mug and plate with cutlery and a football, all covered in moss. My shit scared mind came over all Blair Witchy and I kinda ran to the nearest light patch out of the trees, only to find the edge of the quarry wall going 60 feet or so down to water. I often wonder if the kid did the same as me and found the quarry edge or just left his perfectly good stuff. It has been a long time since I had wanted to tell someone about what I saw, someone who would be willing to believe me and not judge me. It's been many years ago, but I remember it as if it was yesterday. I was at work in Greensboro, North Carolina. Lunchtime came and I left for my friend's house in Allen J. High Point. In any case, it was an early spring day about 12.15 p.m. on a beautiful day. As I recall, it was 1992. As I turned down Nansabe on the way to my friend's house, actually I was almost there. As I drove everything was fine. All of a sudden there was an 8-9 feet human-like being maybe even taller standing on the left side of my car on the side of the road. I couldn't believe my eyes. I slowed down to look up at it and it was very tall. 
The eyes were large and shaped like the normal cat's eyes we see for aliens. He was so black and dark. His cloak as it appeared to me came up, and it seemed like he had on a toboggan type cap. But again it was so black that it melted in together with the cloak. It was skinny, and his eyes were shiny. Very thin and tall. No hands or feet were visible, he was just standing there staring straight at something. As I drove by, I kept looking in my mirror at what I was seeing. All of a sudden it turned and looked at me. Now the road I was on is hilly with up and down small hills. I was so fascinated by what I saw I wanted to come back. I never took my eyes off the humanoid as I could see just a little of him. As I turned around, I still had a visual of the humanoid. As I whipped my car around, maybe three, four seconds with my eyes not on the being, I realized he was past me. I was scared, but also fascinated. I think the only person who believed in me was my friend. I told her and took several shots of tequila at her house which never fazed me. She said when I came flying through her door my face was very white, and she knew something was wrong. I tried to calm down before returning to work. I have never seen another one, but I have seen mysterious things on the North Carolina coast where I go. Haven't seen a Bigfoot, but I had two unbelievable experiences in 2017. The first experience happened at a campground. I was awakened around 4 a.m. by howling coyotes. About three seconds after the coyotes started howling, there was an erupting roar that sounded like it was coming from all sides and completely drowned out the coyotes. It was so loud and powerful that I could feel the vibrations coming up through the ground through my sleeping bag. Clearly nothing I've ever heard before. I've heard others describe hearing a roaring sound from these creatures coupled with the fact that I have studied this mystery for so long, I knew right away that it had to be Bigfoot. This roar was so loud that the creature couldn't have been more than a hundred yards from me which is quite strange in itself, because one side of the campground is a pretty busy road, but nonetheless the area in general of this campground is surrounded by forest. The second experience happened thirty days later. It was not far from where the first experience occurred. This time I stayed at a second campground that was much more secluded and deeper in the forest. It was around 6 p.m. and I and other campers were standing together talking about the hiking we had done earlier that day. Other people were out and about getting campfires started. Also, there was a campground host who walked around introducing himself with a clipboard making sure people had paid and joined in the conversation. It was at this time that all of a sudden roughly 50 yard uphill on a ridge overlooking the campground a tree came crashing down. Moments after the tree hit the ground I and all the others standing around talking heard what can only be described as a loud guttural grunt. This is the kind of grunt you would hear from a silverback gorilla. All of us were startled and asked each other what the heck fell that tree and made that deep guttural grunt sound. One of the other campers even mentioned it was probably Bigfoot. The other campers laughed, but I didn't think it was too funny. This is because if one of those creatures was nearby, we might face a very dangerous situation. Thankfully nothing happened after that, but here is where the story gets really weird. At the back of this campground is a dirt road. This road can be used for hiking or traveling during the hunting season. One of my favorite things to do when backpacking or camping is wake up early, get a fire started, and have a delicious hot cup of coffee. I got up that morning around 6 a.m., got my fire started and fresh coffee made. As I'm sipping coffee out of the dirt road at the back of the campground comes this white SUV completely blacked out. It has a huge sticker of a patty silhouette stuck to the back window. Me being the believer in the existence of these creatures, I have a few similar stickers on my back window, so I took what I saw as a friendly visit from a fellow Bigfoot enthusiast. I casually walked up and said hello and saw if there was anything we could discuss regarding creature activity in the area. As I approached the SUV driver rolled his window down about halfway, and I immediately noticed something odd. First there were two guys in the SUV, and they were both dressed in full tact gear. They had two AR-15s on a gun rack at the back of the interior with both gentlemen wearing military-style boots, pistols at the ankles, black beanies and sunglasses. I mean these guys were completely decked out like law enforcement officer would be, 
but there was no badge, just complete tack dress from head to toe. I then playfully asked, are you guys looking for Bigfoot? The driver of the SUV then said to me, why do you ask? I replied, I see the Bigfoot sticker at the back of your vehicle. I have a couple of those on the back window of my car also. The reply I received is very strange. The driver just looked at me without saying anything. And then the passenger guy in a very stuttering kind of manner said, it's just a practical joke sticker for my girlfriend. After that response, the driver then stepped on the gas and out of the campground they went. I just find it odd that there is a perfectly healthy tree being pushed over by a gorilla-like grunt. Then these two tacked or possible military guys show up the next morning out of nowhere driving a blacked-out SUV with an oversized Sasquatch sticker on the back window. Very odd in my opinion. And that's it. Driving to Anchorage from Fairbanks is a long haul with huge stretches of wilderness and nothing in between. A few towns, but the majority is mountains and plains. In a specific pass, me and my girlfriend at the time saw a floating, upside-down metallic V-shaped figure hovering in the sky. It would disappear, reappear, and show up in random spots. This is an area with no people and no scientific equipment whatsoever. This thing was high enough to be a flying object, but low enough to be seen by us. We stopped the car and stared as it, as it zigzagged in height and distance from us for about 20 minutes, and then it just faded away. It never returned, and to this day we have no idea what the F it was. I have talked to people with similar reports in the same area. I was driving through the deserts of New Mexico alone at night. I'd been on the road for a while at this point. It was pitch black outside. There was, and I stress this, nothing around. I was probably 50 miles or so from the nearest town or rest stop in either direction. At the time, I was listening to some tunes on Spotify that I had saved to my phone earlier as I knew my traveling would take me through dead zones in the Midwest. Suddenly, I hear static over the song. I check my connection to the headphone port on my phone and my radio. Seems fine. The static persists for a few seconds and then stops just as suddenly. Odd, I think, but shrug it off just some sort of electronic interference, even though I'm clearly using a hardwired audio input. It's at this point I realize that my song had stopped playing and it's now dead quiet in my car, aside from the hum of my CRV's little four-cylinder. Then out of the blue I hear whispering coming through my speakers. Multiple voices think of the whispers in the show Lost. I can't make out what they're saying, but I am petrified. Suddenly the whispering stops for a second and I hear a child laugh. More static on the radio and what sounds like a man speaking slowly. Then it was over my tunes came back on. Every hair on my body was stood on end at this point. White knuckle grip on my wheel and I added on about 30 miles per hour and noped the F out of whatever burial ground or dimensional rift I had just driven through. I don't believe in the supernatural at all, and it's likely that I was tired enough to have imagined the whole event, but that doesn't detract from the power the experience had over me in the moment. Far and away, it was the creepiest thing I've ever experienced. I am Jack River, an elite member of a special forces team, trained for the most challenging and dangerous missions. One day, my team and I find ourselves in Kosovo on a mission to prevent the illegal sale of uranium to Iran. As we made our way towards the secret enemy facility, our hearts raced with the gravity of the task ahead. As we approach the facility, we come across a small village that seemed eerily deserted. The air was heavy with an unsettling silence. Our instincts told us to proceed with caution, and as we draw nearer, a horrifying sight awaited us. The ground was littered with the remains of at least a hundred people, victims of an unfathomable massacre. Yet something was peculiar about their wounds. They appeared as if some wild animal had attacked them, leaving gruesome and savage marks. We began inspecting the bodies, trying to make sense of the horror that unfolded in this forsaken place. And then out of nowhere we spot it. A creature like none we have ever encountered before materializes from the side of the hill. 
Its huge form seems insubstantial, as if it were a ghost. We can see the grass beneath its body, and it moves with an otherworldly grace, leaving no trace on the ground. The creature is covered in longish, charcoal-colored hair, giving it an eerie and ominous appearance. Its eyes are two long slits that emit a haunting bright red glow. Instead of a typical nose, there are two holes, and its thick lips curl back to reveal sharp, menacing teeth. Standing at a staggering height of over ten feet on its two legs, it exudes an aura of primal power and ancient terror. Frozen and bewildered, we stand in awe and confusion, trying to comprehend the existence of this creature. But before we can react, it lunges at us with surprising speed and ferocity. A fierce battle ensues as we fight for our lives against this seemingly supernatural foe. With our automatic rifles, we unleash a hail of bullets, determined to bring down this mysterious and deadly adversary. After a grueling and desperate struggle, we managed to bring the creature down. But we had little time to inspect its lifeless form, for the sound of our battle has alerted the local militia. With no choice but to abort our investigation, we called our base for immediate extraction. As we are airlifted to safety, we tried to comprehend what we have just witnessed. It is a sight and experience that challenges everything we thought we knew about the world. In disbelief, we recounted the events to our superiors, struggling to find explanations for the horrors we encountered. From that moment on, we carry with us the haunting memories of that fateful day in Kosovo, where our mission to prevent the illegal sale of uranium was overshadowed by a chilling encounter with a creature beyond our understanding. I worked as a microwave field surveyor, Basically, we made sure there were no obstructions, large buildings, trees, smokestacks that could block the signal transmitted between towers. I typically worked three weeks on, one week off. On this particular month, I had been sent to Pennsylvania. Most of Pennsylvania is great, but every state has its creepy, low population areas. I was assigned to survey a 35-mile path between towers in the state game land's large protected areas. The key to surveying a microwave path is finding the critical points where the signal comes the closest to the ground, usually a mountaintop or hill. In a city, this is fairly simple. You can just drive a few blocks and take measurements. However, the remoteness of the towers made access difficult, and the roads I tried to use were sometimes rutted trails at best. The GPS program Delorme kept sending me down dead ends or onto trails called abandoned road or old mine shaft. This was actually pretty funny at first. At about 7.30 p.m., I was getting nervous. It was getting dark, and I hadn't seen another car, or even a parked hunter's truck in five, six hours. My GPS was spotty, and I wasn't sure if I could honestly remember the way out, at least not before total dark. I found the widest trail I could and began to work my way south, hoping to hit a major road. I was forced to double back northeast by another downed tree on the path. It was very dimly lit outside, and with so many turnoffs, I can't be sure I took the same way back. That's when I came across the little village. Eight small cottages. They looked like remnants of someone's camp from the 50s, 60s. Two burned almost to nothing, the rest with the doors swinging in the wind. No one around, no tracks. Nothing. I feel a little silly writing this. I know that I was just tired and hungry at the end of a long, isolated day but it felt like something was watching me from inside those little cottages. My X-Files or Hills Have Eyes sense was tingling, so I got back in the truck and roared out of there as quick as I could. Our company finished the project, and I haven't been back since. So these events happened when I was in the military. The events in 1979 were so bizarre and so chilling to the men involved that nobody has discussed them publicly, at least not yet. I have been asked not to discuss them. This is the only place where I can tell my story, so here it is. I served in the U.S. Army from 1978 to 1986. During that time, I was stationed at the Tesla Air Base in Tesla, Bosnia, formerly part of Yugoslavia, with the 10th Infantry Division. I was a chemical decontamination specialist, 
which meant I would go out on patrol with the line companies and decontaminate the soldiers and their equipment after they were exposed to chemical warfare agents. I was trained to do this using the M258 a one decon kit, which I carried on my back. It weighed roughly 150 pounds. This thing wasn't small or light to carry, it was a workout. In 1979, our platoon sergeant called us all together and said we were going to participate in a special mission. We were excited, as anything that breaks up the day-to-day -day monotony of guard duty and drills is welcome to soldiers regardless of their rank and position. We were already a pretty tight unit, so we were happy to do whatever we needed to for our fellow soldiers. The platoon sergeant pulled out a map and showed us where we were going. The island of this, a small Croatian island in the Adriatic Sea. We were informed that our mission was to conduct reconnaissance on this, and that we would be inserted by a helicopter to scout the island and make contact with whatever forces were already there. We were told that we would be inserted on the south side of the island and be picked up on the north side. That night we boarded the chopper and flew to this. We were inserted on the south side of the island near a small fishing village, which was mostly abandoned at this time due to military presence. There were some inhabited houses and a small church with a cemetery adjacent to it. I'm not sure what that church is, but I do remember a large cross atop its steeple. The pilot said the locals would not approach the island, at least this section, rumored to be cursed, although I don't believe that. We walked about a mile to an area where we could dig in and set up observation posts, otherwise known as OPS. We dug shallow fighting positions and set up a central OP on a small hill overlooking the town. My friend, who was a specialist for in my unit, and I decided to set up our OP on top of a large rock overlooking the area. We were able to construct in a frame out of some smaller limbs and camouflage netting. This way, we would have some protection from being observed. My friend said he had a bad feeling about this mission, but I laughed it off. I knew he was a little off, but not many soldiers are comfortable with being shot at, so I thought this apprehension was due to the amount of lead in the air when we were fleeing from Kuwait. We set up our OP, camouflaged it, and laid out our MOPP gear in case we needed to go chemical anytime soon. We had our gas masks, chemical protective suits, MOPP suits, rubber boots, chemical gloves, and of course, our M258 A1 decon kits. We watched the town through our scopes for about an hour, and we began noticing what we thought were Yugoslavian soldiers moving around. They were dressed in uniforms similar to that of the Soviet era, but it was different. They even had the red stars and caps. They were at the far end of the village nearest to us when, without warning, they began running towards our OP. I grabbed my M16 and told my friend that we are going chemical. I grabbed my mask and there was a bright flash of light. When I could see again, the soldiers were gone. My friend and I looked at each other and realized we both experienced the same thing. We decided to go check it out. There was no sound, nothing. As I looked at the trees under which the soldiers had been, I noticed that there was a light shimmer in the air where they just passed, kind of like a mirage, like the air or time was moving. It looked very strange. My friend and I were about 75 yards away now from our own OP, and we saw something moving against the rock face. We froze and stared at it for a little bit until we realized it was some sort of lizard. The thing was black, about five feet tall, with a tail that was closer to that of a crocodile. It had a very large head and was holding its body close to the rocks as it moved slowly. It was in a crouching position, and you could tell this was a bipedal being. It seemed to be looking for something, but I have no idea what. We continued back towards the OP, and we heard a sound we could not describe, but can only be said to have sounded like several people screaming all at once. It lasted for just a few seconds, and then there was silence. We approached our OP, but it was completely empty. We had left our rifles behind in the frame when we went to inspect the soldiers. We moved back to where it was, and when we got there, all that remained were our helmets, which had fallen over on their sides with the chin straps still buckled. We didn't think this was possible. We had secured our helmets to the frame because we know the enemy enjoyed booby trapping our equipment. My friend and I went back to our OP. We searched for what was left for about 30 minutes. 
As soon as we reached the edge of the vegetation, it seemed to me that something was out there in front of us. As we walked closer, I realized that there was a group of bipedal creatures, roughly about the size of humans, standing just outside the vegetation line. They all appeared to be wearing some sort of suit covering their bodies. There were roughly nine of them, all standing together in a group. They were acting in a very strange manner, seemingly looking back and forth between my friend and me, with their heads moving almost like that of a bird very cockeyed, as if they were viewing something from far away. My friend and I kept looking at each other, wondering what to do next. We began to slowly back away, but before we could take any more than a couple of steps backward, they walked in our direction, and they were moving fast. It was clear they were agitated in their motion, and just as they were getting closer, another flash of light that blinded me once again. They were gone. At this point, we retreated back towards camp, waiting for the sun to completely come up. After we had made our way down the hill and back, before very long, we noticed there was smoke coming from the distance. We decided to change our course to see if somebody needed help. As we began to move closer, I realized these were two separate fires. We stood and watched them for a while. After about ten minutes, we saw movement. There was a light shining down where the flames were, and what looked to be the same creatures that we had seen before. They seemed to be directing the fire somehow. I thought that it might have been the same group, but my friend pointed out that they all had different colored suits on. He said that some had red, others had blue, and there was even one that had green. We stood and watched them, and we realized they were not alone. There was another group of them moving around in the vegetation, but they looked like humans wearing bright green camouflage. This group eventually moved into the light of the fire, and we could see they were carrying weapons. But one of the human-looking ones walked up to a tree and kind of did something with his hands. The tree lit up and began shooting out a beam of light from its trunk. The creatures slowly stepped back from it all, except one, and engulfed in this beam of light. We realized this was some kind of teleportation or doorway, so we very quietly backed away and ran back to our platoon, reporting what we had seen. I want to emphasize that the following is purely speculation, but after doing some research, I have come up with what I believe are some very valid possibilities. The first set of soldiers we saw were actually these reptilian beings, but disguised as humans in some sort of cloaking form. Let me share with you some information I've gathered. There are three main races of grey aliens known to abduct humans or perform experiments on them. One of them is known as the Zeta Reticuli, discovered in the 1950s by an amateur astronomer. The other two are reptilian, also humanoid and insectoids. There are often races referred to as Nordics and Greys. Nordics are usually described as being humanoid in appearance with pale white skin and blonde hair. Insectoids can be the average human being's height, if not more, and are primarily humanoid insectoid beings. The most common are mantids humanoids. The fire they were controlling looked like some sort of portal when the beam shot out. It was like a teleportation device. I believe that these beings could be experimenting on humans in order to try and create an army to use against us. Maybe they are trying to use the humans in some sort of fighting force. I don't know. It is possible that this might be some sort of retaliation for the Vietnam War. The person who I was with during this, who was also my co-witness, passed away from cancer many years ago. I lived in a rural area when I was around 12 years old. Our neighbors were like five minutes driving away. And behind our five acres of land was all crown land not owned by anyone. As far as I know, this land went on for miles. I loved going for long hikes. Sometimes I'd go out with the family, and we'd be gone for good four or five hour walks deep into the forest. I went with my younger sister, eight, and her friend one day in the fall. About three half hour into the walk, we get a little turned around, found a new trail, and don't recognize any of our usual trees. Sun's still up for a while, so we keep going. Suddenly, we hear a four-wheeler, but it's getting closer. We encounter an older man, with two axes on his four-wheeler and a vicious dog. He was very rude and suspicious of us being there, told us we were on private property, and had to leave now he was almost yelling and clutching an axe the whole time. 
We agreed and apologized and left. We heard him drive off the other way. We decided to run because he was creepy, and we were hours away with no adults or ways to contact anyone. We take an alternative route to cut time down, so we're no longer on that path. Shortly after we hear the four-wheeler close again, we freeze atop a little hill or mound and listen. Four-wheeler guy comes into Vey on the trail we were on. He drives down a ways and truns around a few times. I know he was looking for us. When he's finally far enough away, we book it. Made it back in about two hours. Terrified. Checked with mom or dad and no one owns land back there. He wasn't any of our five neighbors. We weren't allowed to go for hikes alone anymore and my sister's friend was afraid of the woods after that. Realistically, he was just some pot owner guarding his crop, which is equally as scary. Because where I lived, if you stumbled on a crop, people shot first and asked questions later. For years I worked top security clearance at a military base deep in the foothills in Montana. I need you to hold on for me and swallow the pill because things I worked on out of this base were straight out of a science fiction flick. I'm talking particularly about time travel, part of the project I had a hand in playing. I won't say which because our team was larger and I don't want to be singled out by what I did, therefore getting traced back to me. But we helped the military and government establish a connection to what we now know as alternate realities or universes, something that is newer to pop culture. But back in the 70s and 80s, it was a groundbreaking top secret discovery. These are realities that coexist within our own timeline, but things have been slightly altered. It was my understanding while working on the project. We were not able to go back in time and affect our own timeline but the timeline of other realities was something we could do. One interesting thing is the few people they did send back. Many of them had to be treated medically before being sent back. The reason being the bacteria in the air and around you and around people change from time to time. For example, if you were to go back right now to 1D6-23, you would probably die pretty quickly due to an overload of foreign bacteria your body is not used to. Sure, you do have an immune system, but there's no way you would be able to build up an immunity fast enough to survive. Even going back to simply 1921 can kill a man. Let's just say that there were procedures done on our subjects to ensure this went fine. Many of our subjects died during the course of having their atoms disintegrated while going to, but some were successful. It wasn't so much as time portals as it was a gateway to another space and time. Think of it like harnessing the power of a black hole. In essence, we were simply bending space and time to visit other planes. There were no major missions to go back and change the course of history, rather just experiment to control the technology. And to have that, the Chinese government has been working on this technology for years, and we were told when we were successful, they are actually ahead of us by about three. They have already apparently changed multiple timelines, which, by the way, there are several billion, and that's a fairly low estimate. When subjects are sent back to a specific time frame, they are medically prepped for that era as well as stripped of all clothing and are aesthetically equipped for their time. This way, they can blend in seamlessly without drawing attention to themselves. The purpose of all this is, from what I've been told, is to gather large amounts of intel. The Chinese government is using this technology for more nefarious and selfish reasons. We had a test campaign once our equipment proved to be successful with going back over 70 years in the alpha phase. We, well, I guess you can say changed a timeline permanently. One mission, for example, was going back in October of 1942, months before the events of Pearl Harbor, and completely washed away the island of Japan using advanced sonar weaponry, causing massive earthquakes and tsunamis all around the island. This was just to prove the type of power and potential that we had. It was an experiment run. Safe to say, within six days of our first subject going back to that time period, Japan ceased to exist, and therefore Pearl Harbor had never happened and changed the entire course of modern history after that for that timeline. Our man was pulled back in. Whatever events have taken place in that timeline since, we will never know. I need to be very careful now with how much information I release, so for this time, I'm going to stop here and let you digest that. I'll try and follow up shortly, but I have to be careful.
take care. I had been on solo hunting trips before, but this one felt different from the start. The Texan forest was vast, and I knew there were plenty of deer to be found deep within the woods. The day was pleasant, and the sunlight filtered through the leaves, creating a patchwork of shadows on the forest floor. As I ventured further into the wilderness, the trees grew denser, and the sunlight gradually faded away. I followed a narrow, winding path, trusting my instincts to lead me to a good hunting spot. But then, something caught my attention. A strange rustling sound broke the otherwise serene ambience. I froze my senses on high alert. With every cautious step I took, the rustling grew louder and more distinct. My heart pounded in my chest as I pushed through the thick undergrowth, curiosity overcoming my initial fear. That's when I saw a large, dark figure walking upright through the trees, directly in my direction. My instincts kicked in, and I quickly turned and sought refuge behind a nearby tree. My breaths were shallow and rapid as I peered from behind the trunk to catch a glimpse of the mysterious creature. To my horror, it was merely ten feet away from me, and the details of its appearance sent shivers down my spine. The creature was black, darker than the shadows around it. It stood slightly shorter than me but had a muscular build, and there was no visible neck connecting its massive head to its body. It moved with a strange grace, as if it was accustomed to stalking through these woods undetected. As it stopped at the tree I was hiding behind, it lifted its head, and I noticed it had no visible eyes. Instead, its nose pointed upward, sniffing the air intently. My heart pounded louder, and I could hear my blood rushing in my ears. Fear held me in its grasp, rendering me motionless. I dared not make a sound, terrified that even the slightest noise might attract its attention. My fingers clutched the rifle in my trembling hands, but I couldn't bring myself to take aim. In an agonizing moment, the creature turned around and walked away, seemingly uninterested in my presence. It moved with a casual, almost nonchalant gait, disappearing deeper into the forest as if it had never been there. My body felt numb with terror as I finally released the breath I didn't realize I had been holding. Unable to comprehend what I had just witnessed, I hesitated to leave my hiding spot. Eventually, I mustered the courage to step out cautiously, my mind racing with questions and uncertainty. As I resumed my hunt for deer, I couldn't shake off the image of that enigmatic creature. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, I spotted a deer grazing not too far away. My fear had subsided enough for my hunting instincts to kick back in. I aimed carefully, held my breath, and pulled the trigger. The loud crack of the gunshot filled the air, and the bullet missed the target. Deer escaped, fading away into the forest once again. Confused and shaken, I decided it was best to retreat. I made my way back home, the encounter with the mysterious creature replaying in my mind over and over. When I returned, my wife eagerly asked if I had hunted anything. I couldn't find the words to describe what I had seen, so I remained silent knowing that some secrets were best kept hidden deep within the heart of the secluded Texas forest. In the dark depths of the Pine Barrens, I was working alone in the park one night when my radio came to life. This is right after a fellow ranger told me about seeing a strange orange light above the trees right around 2 a.m. the previous week. His story kind of freaked me out, so naturally, I was a bit nervous myself patrolling the night woods. Curiosity got the best of me, and I decided to keep my radio on with low volume so I could hear chatter coming over the airwaves. Now I had my dog at my side, an older German shepherd named Sasha, trained in search and rescue. She was a very loyal companion, even though she couldn't do much more except keep me company. We patrolled for about an hour when my radio came to life again with reports of something attacking hikers just outside on Route 563. I had parked the vehicle along the road, hiked into that section of trail armed with nothing but a pistol, two canisters of pepper spray, bear spray, my flashlight, and Sasha by my side, who was now on high alert, and whatever courage I could personally muster up. We walked for nearly five minutes in the perimeter of the woods. Sasha kept sniffing at the air, whining. Something was definitely on her mind. 
Suddenly, she let out a yelp and took off into the brush, and without warning, I had to use all my strength to hold on to her leash as she dragged me through briars and thorns until she stopped dead in her tracks. Almost 100 feet away from where we were, I could not see her, but I could hear her growling and whimpering. I managed to get a glimpse of something. It was big and moving really fast. At this point, both of us were terrified. Sasha's fur standing straight up on edge and my heart pounding so hard against my chest, I thought it would burst at any moment. My radio squawked again. We just received another call about an attack near the South Lake in the Pine Barrens. The volume was down low enough that I could only hear it just clearly. I told myself that whatever it was must have been close, and knowing my luck, which exactly wasn't running high at the moment, I would run into this thing. And then I heard the howling right off to my right. Sasha had already begun going crazy, yelping and growling like mad. Well, I did the only thing I felt could save us. I whistled for her, and we both took off in a full sprint away from this thing, Sasha leading the way and being so much faster than I. At this point, every time we stopped moving, it would begin chasing us, and I lost sight of Sasha in the darkness, but kept on running through the briars and bramble, trying to come up to her. I had fallen into some briar where my ankles swelled up really bad. I was bleeding. What's worse, I could hear something very big trailing behind me. I reached for my radio to let dispatch know what happened. It was gone. Sasha's leash and collar were there, but no radio. I looked around frantically in the dark of the night until a howl and growl both came down below right where I just was. That growl is 100% confirmation that I did indeed see something back there that I could not wrap my mind around. It sounded like a very large wolf, but I wasn't exactly sure. Any doubts about this creature's existence had completely evaporated in my mind, as what I can only imagine as a monster became a nightmarish reality. Luckily for me, I found Sasha and retreated back to my vehicle. It seemed that the attacks had died down, and whatever creature this was, which I'm pretty sure was not a normal wolf or bear, disappeared entirely. Luckily, I never saw it. But this experience is still fresh in my mind, even though it's been years. I have never felt so uneasy at my job before. I'm never going back to that section of woods again. My husband was on his way to work around 4 a.m. on a rural road, while rounding in his bend when his headlights hit a large, dark brown figure that was sitting about 30 feet off the road, watching the road. He described the figure as about four feet tall sitting with legs bent out in front of it. Wolf-like face, large pointed ears, does not remember I shine leaning back on human-like arms. My husband immediately felt endangered and floored his vehicle's accelerator. This man has no fear of humans. I've known him for 30 years and have never seen him afraid of a natural being. He's hunted and fished since childhood. It took him a couple of years before he told me about this sighting. He said his first thought was that thing can catch this car, rip me out and eat me if it wants to. He was paranoid and had his head on a swivel all that day. Still, to this day, he cannot drive past that location without feeling some kind of way. The second sighting occurred in 2010 and happened to a co-worker. I noticed she was acting strangely whenever we talked about spooky things, so I asked her what was up. She said, Okay, don't think I'm crazy. Then she went on to tell me how one night, she was driving home from a late second shift between midnight 1 and M, about five or so miles from where the first sighting occurred. She had to slow down to a near stop to turn onto a road that would take her home. That's when she began to hear what sounded like running alongside her car. That's when she glanced out her driver's window and saw the most horrible face. Her first thought was, werewolf. She described it as being black and gray in color, with large teeth. She said she didn't look again, but could hear it running next to her car until she reached 45-50 miles per hour. That's no joke on a back road. She was scared out of her wits. After arriving home, she ran to the door, dropped the keys, went inside, closed all the curtains, and did not sleep a wink that night. We're both nurses and I've known her for about seven years. She grew up in New York City and is not a storyteller. Neither of these people likes to talk about their sightings. You can see a change in them when their encounters are brought up. 
I don't need to see one to believe them. I know they exist. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.